he cheated Las Vegas out of millions. There was no slot machine he couldn't beat. He's been doing this for at least 20 years, and as time went on, he got better and better at it. A brilliant inventor, he tinkered his way into the biggest casino heist in history. He was a gaming public enemy number one. There was nothing they could do to stop the slot machine genius. Las Vegas, the mecca of gambling, where millions of visitors are seduced by money for nothing. The games can be like a drug, and the most addictive of all is the slot machine. People that play slot machines now have grown up in the video game era, which has increased the popularity of slot machines. We've got 40 million visitors a year, and, and these casinos are busy most all of the time. Every gambler is playing to win, but the biggest winners in Vegas are the casinos themselves. In the state of Nevada last, last year, about $9.7 billion was made in casino revenue, and about $6.6 .6 billion of that was won by in the slot machines. Resisting temptation in Sin City can be hard, and for some, the temptation is to cheat. Gaming crime in America is, is a major problem. Of course, here in Las Vegas, a large percentage of our income in the state is based on gaming revenue, so it's a more serious problem here than other areas. For those cheaters who really know their slots, gaming crime can be a lucrative business. A cheater can make anywhere between a few bucks a day to tens of thousands of dollars a day. With 210,000 slot machines in Nevada, security is a challenge. Slot machines now account for 90% of floor space in casinos. With so many machines, cheaters often go undetected. There's no dealer or pit boss keeping an eagle eye on every player. The only person watching you is surveillance if they catch you. In 1992, Las Vegas fell victim to one of the biggest gambling thefts in history. An estimated $2.5 million was plundered from slot machines up and down the strip, all by a single gang. Every casino was hit. The Sahara, Paris, Caesars Palace, they were just the tip of the iceberg. But amazingly, the casinos didn't even know they were under attack. It seemed like the perfect heist. No eyewitnesses, no evidence, no 911 calls. For the police, it was just business as usual. You don't know you're being cheated unless you catch the people cheating you. So it's very difficult to say how, to estimate how much is, is being stolen up here. In this case, the mastermind and his gang were making seriously big bucks. I don't have an exact figure. I just know millions of dollars that they were losing in revenue. We know that one group could be fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars a day, and we're not talking about working an eight-hour day. Casino after casino was hit. Money was pouring from their doors. Losses were mounting rapidly. Yet still, no one knew how it was happening. I would say all of them together probably proved to be the one of the most detrimental cheating groups probably in history of game. Investigators didn't yet know that the mastermind outwitting them was a TV repairman. They'd come to know him as the slot machine genius. He was beating the casinos at their own game. But just how long could his winning streak last? In 1992, Vegas was hemorrhaging money. The casinos were busy, but night after night, the profits were down. It was a mystery. Someone was stealing from the slots. But who? 
His name was Tommy Glenn Carmichael. In a single year, he cheated the strip out of an estimated $2.5 million. He became known as the slot machine genius, and he didn't earn that title overnight. Carmichael had been beating the slot since he was a youth. Tommy Carmichael used to hang with a uh, group of individuals in the Tulsa, Oklahoma area. They started off as poker and pool buddies. They used to always meet in this one pool hall. And then they developed into what we call stringers. Carmichael and his friends learned to steal from slot machines using an increasingly popular device known as a yo-yo. They would just tie a string onto a, a coin and you just keep bobbing it up and down, it would give credits to the machine. After that, manufacturers started getting wise because it started becoming an epidemic. They remanufactured the machines to stop this way of cheating. But for Tommy, the games had just begun. He was determined that no slot machine would ever defeat him. Carmichael ran his own TV repair business but his mind was always on bigger things. When TV sets failed to provide him with the excitement and the fortune that he dreamed of, he turned to slots. Tommy was able to get a hold of an old slot machine. And he tinkered with it. Carmichael analyzed the inner workings of the slot machine. He worked hard at trying to develop devices. He actually had slot machines in his home uh, where he would spend many hours experimenting and developing devices. With the yo-yo now obsolete, he needed to invent a new tool. After six months of tinkering with his slot machine, he finally found its Achilles heel. He invented the first sophisticated slot cheating device, which we call either the slider or the monkey paw. It's used to activate the hopper. To, to, uh, for the, the hopper is where the coins are kept, and it activates the motor, and they'll start pulling coins out. The slider was simple, yet brilliant. Made out of spring steel and guitar wire, Carmichael knew exactly which part of the machine he was aiming for, the jackpot switch. And he hit it every time. But it wasn't long before the industry got wise to the slider, too. They quickly modified their machines so they couldn't be beat. This didn't stop Tommy Carmichael. He made it his mission to outwit every move the industry made to combat cheaters. He incorporated himself. He started a company called Global Enterprise Research and Development. With his corporation, he was able to purchase slot machines. Now he was able to break down these machines, again, to find their weaknesses. Carmichael's next invention was his most successful, the light wand. The, the light wand is a light bulb that um, uh, they put into the payout chute, and it blinds the uh, sensor. It makes the coins continually pour out. It was simple, yet ingenious. A rigid wire attached to a small bulb. Poke the wand up the payout chute at just the right angle, and you've hit payday. The bright light tricks a sensor on a circuit board, causing the machine to drop its load. Slim and easy to conceal, it was the key that would unlock him millions from the Las Vegas Strip. Carmichael and his associates, David Pereira and Michael Balsamo, were now ready for the big time. In 1992, armed with light wands, they hit every casino on the strip. Their biggest challenge was to avoid getting caught in the act. They have a system set up. Uh, they have blockers to block the view from the surveillance cameras, and they try to conceal everything they're doing. They try not to bring attention to themselves. They do know the system. They do know if you uh, hit the slot machine, you're gonna hear a lot of coins coming out. That catches a lot of people's attention. 
So instead of hearing all those coins hitting the tray, which makes a lot of noise, they'll cup the coins and then drop them. So it makes a lot less noise. Again, a maneuver that will help them avoid detection. The well-planned demo seemed foolproof. Working every day, Carmichael's gang could bank $7,000 in one session. At the end of 92, they'd made an estimated two and a half million dollars. Living out of a motorhome meant they could move around easily and avoid being traced through hotel paper trails. It even got to the point where they were taking cruises on cruise ships and they would cheat the slot machines there. It's like their way of vacation, just to pay for their trip. That was their, that was their enjoyment. It was a very profitable year, but Carmichael knew when it was time to change tack. And they got to the point where they knew law enforcement was wise to their uh, scam. So instead of threatening themselves with getting caught, they started selling it and teaching it. Carmichael built a cheating empire. Through his corporation, he began marketing his tools and his tips to the criminal underworld. Carmichael's business was thriving. His inventions were making him a fortune. He'd been doing this for at least 20 years, and as time went on, he got better and better at it. The former TV repairman was now so rich, he could have packed up and retired to a desert island. But like an addicted gambler, he just couldn't stop cheating. And his greed was about to get the better of his genius. Tommy Carmichael, the slot machine genius had been successfully cheating the slots and selling his homemade devices for years. His optic light wand alone had netted him millions. As the casinos updated their slot machines with anti-cheating devices, his inventions just kept getting better. The casinos and police were at their wit's end. The manufacturers, again, would create something to stop like the optic device. It didn't take much more than a few months, maybe four months at the most, until Tommy created, they call it the, the double-A device, which they call the anti-anti cheating device, in which beat this system. Carmichael's devices were selling like hotcakes. He was the mastermind behind a wave of slot cheating spreading across America. By the time it reached Atlantic City, the casinos were getting wise to it and police were determined to fight it. We were pretty ignorant of what was going on until we got hit. So I got together with one of the uh, Nevada Gaming Board agents and we developed a good rapport sharing information. What we did is we got contacts with all the people in their respective gaming agencies and we developed like a network. The cheating epidemic was vast. And when gaming crime crossed state lines, it was time for the FBI to get involved. There are agents with the Gaming Control Board that work with the FBI every day of the week, and we have agents that are assigned to work with them on a very regular basis also. So it's a continuing relationship. Surveillance operators meet monthly. Uh, uh, we attend those meetings, uh, and they discuss uh, different cheating methods and, and how to reprint them. And, and what may have occurred at their casino, as an example, recently. Authorities gathered their forces against the cheaters. Detective Sergeant Jim Flaumer had received a number of tips that there was one slot machine genius behind it all, and he was determined to hunt him down. We went out to Vegas and started digging up um, to find out who he was and who he worked for. And what, every time we talked to somebody, especially ex-cheaters, everybody says the same thing. What are you harassing me for? I'm just a small fish. Tommy Carmichael's the big fish. He had the capabilities, and he surely had the means of bringing the slot industry to its knees. Both the police and the gaming industry strengthened their resolve against him. 
Detective Flaumer joined forces with other authorities, arresting slot cheats from city to city. Our primary concern at this point in juncture was to squeeze in the most information we can get. And again, other jurisdictions were doing that also. Intelligence to us was more important than throwing somebody in jail. Tommy Carmichael himself was still out there and still cheating. Although he and his men were careful to block security cameras from catching them in action, it wasn't long before one casino in Atlantic City spotted something dodgy. Back in 99, we were called by the show about suspicious activity, um, possible slot cheating. So we looked at the tape and we were satisfied this guy was using a device. We had security detain him. Flaumer and his men made a beeline for him. Carmichael knew he'd been nabbed. In the struggle to get away, he dropped his light line. He immediately denied the device was his, and due to the lack of clear evidence on the security tape, Detective Flaumer was forced to let him go. At the time, Flaumer thought the man he'd apprehended was just another slot cheat. At that time, we didn't know it was Tommy Carmichael. Because again, we're not looking at his face, we're looking at his hands and his actions in the slot machine. He had no idea that Tommy Glenn Carmichael, the slot machine genius he'd been hunting for years, had just slipped through his fingers. By now, the FBI had identified Carmichael as their prime suspect. They also had the names of his two accomplices, David Pereira and Mike Balsamo. The net was closing around them. We had a wiretap on Carmichael's phone and on Balsamo's phone and Pereira's phone. And they spoke constantly uh, about building devices and perfecting devices. A new device that they had, uh, which had they perfected it, according to their own estimates, they could have made $10,000 a day. And uh, they had experimented with it. Uh, we know from their phone calls that had, they had had some success with it already. It was something new, something a little different from what they usually used. It would add credits to the machine, as many as 30, 35 credits per second added to the machine. They had to act fast. If Tommy Carmichael was given the chance to distribute his new device, the gaming industry would be brought to its knees. <laughs> Authorities were moving in on Tommy Carmichael, the slot machine genius. The FBI had taped conversations between Carmichael and his associates. The mastermind, it appeared, was planning the launch of a brand new cheating device, capable of cleaning out slot machines like never before. It was their plan to use it over a period of about six months, and they had estimated that they could each make a million dollars in six months, and then they were going to retire from the cheating business. Unfortunately, uh, we apprehended them before they could use the device. With the wiretap evidence in hand, Detective Flaumer could finally make an arrest. On July 2nd, 2001, he got a tip that Carmichael was in Atlantic City, up to his old tricks. Detective Flaumer and his team immediately sprang into action. Tommy Carmichael was caught in the act. This time, there was no escape. And I asked him his name. And he said, Tommy Carmichael. I said, is it Tommy Glenn Carmichael? And he looks up. In surprise. I said, you know what? I mean, you got a lot to talk about. I've been looking for you for a long time. The wiretap evidence meant that Carmichael's whole gang would be going down with him. Sure enough, a few weeks later, David Pereira and Mike Balsamo were also tracked down and arrested. By this time, Tommy Carmichael had been stealing from casinos for 20 years. In those two decades, the amount he cheated from slot machines can only be guessed at. 
Uh, it's estimated that millions of dollars are stolen. Uh, I'm sure it, had we not caught Tommy Carmichael, millions more have been, would have been stolen. I think he got to the point where he just knew all the ins and outs of a slot machine. No matter what they created, I firmly believe he will beat it. In September 2001, Tommy Carmichael was sentenced to 18 months behind bars, but he cooperated with authorities in return for a reduced sentence. Carmichael was released after serving about a year. Most of it was uh, confinement up to the time he entered his plea of guilty. Uh, I understand now he's just living in Oklahoma, I believe, and that uh, he's working for a consulting company that deals in gaming devices. Today, Tommy Carmichael's addiction to slot machines is still being fed, but on the right side of the law. In fact, he has recently invented a new anti-cheating device, which he calls the protector. With the genius now working for them, not against them, the gaming industry can finally breathe a sigh of relief.